Chapter Seventeen of the God of All Comfort. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Carol Box. The God of All Comfort by Hannah Whittle Smith. Chapter Seventeen. God is enough. My soul, wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from Him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defence. I shall not be moved. In God is my salvation and my glory. The rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. The last and greatest lesson that the soul has to learn is the fact that God, and God alone, is enough for all its needs. This is the lesson that all his dealings with us are meant to teach, and this is the crowning discovery of our whole Christian life. God is enough. We have been considering in this book some aspects of the character and the ways of God as revealed to us in the Lord Jesus Christ, and also some of the mistakes which prevent us from appropriating the fullness that is ours in Him. And now in conclusion I want to tell, as best I can, what seems to me the outcome of the whole matter. If God is what He would seem to be from the revealings we have been considering, if he is indeed the God of all comfort, as we have seen, if he is our shepherd, if he is really and truly our father, if, in short, all the many aspects we have been studying of his character and his ways are actually true, then we must, it seems to me, come to the positive conviction that he is, in himself alone, enough for all our possible needs, and that we may safely rest in him absolutely and forever. Most Christians have, I suppose, sung more often than they could count, these words in one of our most familiar hymns. Thou, O Christ, art all I want, more than all in thee I find. But I doubt whether all of us could honestly say that the words have expressed any reality in our own experience. Christ has not been all we want. We have wanted a great many things besides him. We have wanted fervent feelings about him or realizations of his presence with us, or an interior revelation of his love, or else we have demanded satisfactory schemes of doctrine, or successful Christian work, or something of one sort or another besides himself that will constitute a personal claim upon him. Just Christ himself, Christ alone, without the addition of any of our experiences concerning him, has not been enough for us in spite of all our singing and we do not even see how it is possible that he could be enough. The psalmist said in those old days, My soul, wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from him. But now the Christian says, My soul, wait thou upon my sound doctrines, for my expectation is from them. Or, My soul, wait thou on my good disposition and feelings, or upon my righteous works, or upon my fervent prayers, or upon my earnest striving for my expectation is from these. To wait upon God only seems one of the unsafest things they can do, and to have their expectation from Him alone is like building on the sand. They reach out on every side for something to depend on, and not until everything else fails will they put their trust in God alone. George MacDonald says, We look upon God as our last and feeblest resource. We only go to Him when we have nowhere else to go. And then we learn that the storms of life have driven us, not upon the rocks, but into the desired haven. No soul can be really at rest until it has given up all dependence on everything else and has been forced to depend on the Lord alone. As long as our expectation is from other things, nothing but disappointment awaits us. Feelings may change and will change with our changing circumstances. Doctrines and dogmas may be upset. Christian work may come to naught. Prayers may seem to lose their fervency. Promises may seem to fail. Everything that we have believed in or depended upon may seem to be swept away. And only God is left. Just God, the bare God, if I may be allowed the expression, simply and only God. We say sometimes... If I could only find a promise to fit my case, I could then be at rest. But promises may be misunderstood or misapplied, and at the moment when we are leaning all our weight upon them, 
they may seem utterly to fail us but the promiser who is behind his promises and is infinitely more than his promises can never fail nor change the little child does not need to have any promises from its mother to make it content it has its mother herself and she is enough its mother is better than a thousand promises in our highest ideal of love or friendship promises do not enter one party may love to make promises just as our lord does but the other party does not need them the personality of lover or friend is better than all their promises and should every promise be wiped out of the bible we would still have god left and god would be enough again i repeat it only god he himself just as he is without the addition of anything on our part whether it be disposition or feelings or experiences or good works or sound doctrines or any other thing either outward or inward god only is my rock and my salvation he is my defence i shall not be moved i do not mean by this that we are not to have feelings or experiences or revelations or good works or sound doctrines we may have all of these but they must be the result of salvation and never the procuring cause and they can never be depended upon as being any indication of our spiritual condition they are all things that come and go and are dependent often upon the state of our health or the condition of our surroundings or even sometimes upon the quarter of the wind some people for instance can never believe that god loves them when the wind is in slightest degree as the groundwork for our confidence or our joy we are sure to come to grief what i do mean is that we are to hold ourselves absolutely independent of them all resting in only the grand magnificent fact that god is and that he is our saviour our inner life prospers just as well and is just as triumphant without these personal experiences or personal doings as it is with them we are to find god the fact of god sufficient for all our spiritual needs whether we feel ourselves to be in a desert or in a fertile valley we are to say with the prophet although the fig tree shall not blossom neither shall fruit be in the vines the labour of the olive shall fail and the field shall yield no meat the flock shall be cut off from the fold and there shall be no herd in the stall yet i will rejoice in the lord i will joy in the god of my salvation the soul is made for this and can never find rest short of it all god's dealings with us therefore are shaped to this end and he is often obliged to deprive us of all joy in everything else in order that he may force us to find our joy only and altogether in himself it is all very well perhaps to rejoice in his promises or to rejoice in the revelations he may have granted us or in the experiences we may have realized but to rejoice in the promiser himself himself alone without promises or experiences or revelations this is crowning point of christian life and this is the only place where we can know the peace which passes all understanding and which nothing can disturb it is difficult to explain just what i mean we have so accustomed ourselves to consider all these accompaniments of the spiritual life as being the spiritual life itself that it is hard to detach ourselves from them we cannot think that the lord can be anything to us unless we find in ourselves something to assure us of his love and his care and when we talk about finding our all in him we generally mean that we find it in our feelings or our views about him if for instance we feel a glow of love toward him then we can say heartily that he is enough but when this glow fails as sooner or later it is almost sure to do then we no longer feel that we have found our all in him the truth is that what satisfies us is not the lord but our own feelings about the lord but we are not conscious of this and consequently when our feelings fail we think it is the lord who has failed and we are plunged into darkness of course all this is very foolish but it is such a common experience that very few can see how foolish it is perhaps an illustration may help us to clear a vision let us think of a man accused of a crime standing before a judge which would be the thing of the moment for that man his own feelings toward the judge or the judge's feelings toward him would he spend his time watching his own emotions and trying to see whether he felt that the judge was favourable to him or would he watch the judge and try to discover from his looks or his words whether or not to expect a favourable judgment 
of course we will say at once that the man's own feelings are not of the slightest account in the matter and that only the opinions and feelings of the judge are worth a moment's thought the man might have all the glows and all the experiences conceivable but these would avail absolutely nothing upon the judge only would everything depend this is what we would call a self-evident fact in the same way if we will only bring our common sense to bear upon the subject we cannot help seeing that the only really vital thing in our relations with the lord is not what are our feelings toward him but what are his feelings toward us the man who is being tried must find in the judge all he needs if he is to find it at all his sufficiency cannot possibly be of himself but it must be of the one upon whom his fate depends and our sufficiency the apostle says is not of ourselves but of god this then is what i mean by god being enough it is that we find in him in the fact of his existence and of his character all that we can possibly want for everything god is must be our answer to every question and every cry of need if there is any lack in the one who has undertaken to save us nothing supplementary we can do will avail to make it up and if there is no lack in him then he of himself and in himself is enough i wish it were possible to make my meaning plain for i believe it is the secret of permanent deliverance from all the discomfort and unrest of every christian life your discomfort and unrest arise from your strenuous but useless efforts to get up some satisfactory basis of confidence within yourselves such for instance as what you consider to be the proper feelings or the right amount of fervour or earnestness or at least if nothing else a sufficient degree of interest in spiritual matters and because none of these things are ever satisfactory and i may tell you never will be it is impossible for your religious life to be anything but uncomfortable but if we see that all our salvation from beginning to end depends on the lord alone and if we have learned that he is able and willing to do for us exceeding abundantly above all we can ask or think then peace and comfort cannot fail to reign supreme everything depends upon whether the lord in and of himself is enough for our salvation or whether other things must be added on our part to make him sufficient the thing that helped me personally more than anything else to come to a conviction that god was really enough for me was an experience i had some years ago it was at a time in my religious life when i was passing through a great deal of questioning and perplexity and i felt that no christian had ever had such peculiar difficulties as mine before there happened to be staying near me just then for a few weeks a lady who was considered to be a deeply spiritual christian and to whom i had been advised to apply for spiritual help i summoned up my courage therefore one afternoon and went to see her pouring out my troubles i expected of course that she would take a deep interest in me and would be at great pains to do all she could to help me she listened patiently enough and did not interrupt me but when i had finished my story and had paused expecting sympathy and consideration she simply said yes all you say may be very true but then in spite of it all there is god i waited a few moments for something more but nothing came and my friend and teacher had the air of having said all that was necessary but i continued surely you did not understand how very serious and perplexing my difficulties are oh yes i did replied my friend but then as i tell you there is god and i could not induce her to make any other answer it seemed to me most disappointing and unsatisfactory i felt that my peculiar and really harrowing experiences could not be met by anything so simple as merely the statement yes but there is god i knew god was there of course but i felt i needed something more than just god and i came to the conclusion that my friend for all her great reputation as a spiritual teacher was at any rate not able to grapple with a peculiar case such as mine however my need was so great that i did not give up with my first trial but went to her again and again always with the hope that she would some time begin to understand the importance of my difficulties and would give me adequate help it was of no avail i was never able to draw forth any other answer always to everything would come the simple reply with an air of entirely dismissing the subject yes i know but there is god 
and at last by dint of her continual repetition i became convinced that my friend really and truly believed that the mere fact of the existence of god as the creator and redeemer of mankind and of me as a member of the race was an all-sufficient answer to every possible need of his creatures and at last because she said it so often and seemed so sure i began dimly to wonder whether after all god might not be enough even for my need overwhelming and secular as i felt it to be from wondering i came gradually to believing that being my creator and redeemer he must be enough and at last a conviction burst upon me that he really was enough and my eyes were open to the fact of the absolute and utter all-sufficiency of god my troubles disappeared like magic and i did nothing but wonder how i could ever have been such an idiot as to be troubled by them when all the while there was god the almighty and all-seeing god the god who had created me and was therefore on my side and eager to care for me and help me i had found out that god was enough and my soul was at rest the all-sufficiency of god ought to be as complete to the child of god as the all-sufficiency of a good mother is to the child of that mother we all know the utter rest of the little child in the mother's presence and the mother's love that its mother is there is enough to make all fears and all troubles disappear it does not need the mother to make any promises she herself just as she is without promises and without explanations is all that the child needs my own experience as a child taught me this beyond any possibility of question my mother was the remedy for all my own ills and i fully believed for the ills of the whole world if they could be brought to her and when any one expressed doubts as to her capacity to remedy everything i remembered with what fine scorn i used to annihilate them by saying ah but you don't know my mother and now when any tempest-tossed soul fails to see that god is enough i feel like saying not with scorn but with infinite pity ah dear friend you do not know god did you know him you could not help seeing that he is the remedy for every need of your soul and that he is an all-sufficient remedy god is enough even though no promise may seem to fit your case nor any inward assurance give you confidence the promiser is more than his promises and his existence is a surer ground of confidence than the most fervent inward feelings o oh, utter but the name of god down in the heart of hearts and see how from the soul at once all anxious fear departs but some one may say all this is no doubt true and i could easily believe it if i could only be sure it applied to me but i am so good for nothing and so full of sin that i do not feel as if i had any claim to such riches of grace all the more if you are good for nothing and full of sin have you a claim on the all-sufficiency of god your very good for nothingness and sinfulness are your loudest claims as someone has said it is only the sinner that wants salvation who stands in the saviour's path and the bible declares that christ jesus came into the world to save sinners not to save the righteous not to save the fervent not to save the earnest workers but simply and only to save sinners why then should we spend our time and energies in trying to create a claim which after all is no claim but only a hindrance as long as our attention is turned upon ourselves and our own experiences just so long as it is turned away from the lord this is plain common sense as i have said elsewhere we can only see the thing we look at and while we are looking at ourselves we simply cannot behold god it is not that he hides himself he is always there in full view of all who look unto him but if we are looking in another direction we cannot expect to see him heretofore it may be our eyes have been so fixed upon ourselves that all our interior questioning has been simply and only as regarded our own condition is my love of god warm enough am i enough in earnest are my feeling toward him what they ought to be have i enough zeal do i feel my need as i ought and we have been miserable because we have never been able to answer these questions satisfactorily although we do not know it it has been a mercy we could never answer them satisfactorily for if we had the self in us would have been exalted and we should have been filled with self-congratulation and pride if we want to see god our interior questioning must be not about ourselves but about him 
how does god feel toward me is his love for me warm enough has he enough zeal does he feel my need deeply enough is he sufficiently in earnest although these questions may seem irreverent to some they simply embody the doubts and fears of a great many doubting hearts and they only need to be asked in order to prove the fact that these doubts and fears are in themselves the real irreverence we all know what would be the triumphant answers to such questions no doubts could withstand their testimony and the soul that asks and answers them honestly will be shut up to a profound and absolute conviction that god is and must be enough all things are yours declares the apostle whether paul or apollos or cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come all are yours and ye are christ's and christ is god's it would be impossible for any statement to be more all-embracing and all things are yours because you belong to christ not because you are so good and so worthy but simply and only because you belong to christ all things we need are part of our inheritance in him and they only await our claiming let our needs and difficulties be as great as they may there is in these all things a supply exceeding abundantly above all we can ask or think because he is all must go right for us because the mother is all must go right up to the measure of her ability for her children and infinitely more must this be true of the lord to the child there is behind all that changes and can change the one unchangeable fact of the mother's existence while the mother lives the child must be cared for and while god lives his children must be cared for as well what else could he do being what he is neglect indifference forgetfulness ignorance are all impossible to him he knows everything he cares about everything he can manage everything and he loves us what more could we ask god's saints in all ages have known this and have realized that god was enough for them job said out of the depths of sorrow and trials which few can equal though he slay me yet will i trust in him david could say in the moment of his keenest anguish yea though i walk through the valley of the shadow of death yet i will fear no evil for thou art with me and again he could say god is our refuge and strength a very present help in trouble therefore will not we fear though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea though the waters thereof roar and be troubled though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof god is in the midst of her she shall not be moved god shall help her and that right early paul could say triumphantly in the midst of many and grievous trials for i am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of god which is in christ jesus our lord therefore o doubting and sorrowful christian hearts in the face of all we have learned concerning the god of all comfort cannot you realize with job and david and paul and the saints of all ages that nothing else is needed to quiet all your fears but just this that god is his simple existence is all the warrant your need requires for its certain relieving nothing can separate you from his love absolutely nothing neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature every possible contingency is provided for here and not one of them can separate you from the love of god which is in christ jesus our lord after such a declaration as this how can any of us dare to question or doubt god's love and since he loves us he cannot exist and fail to help us do we not know by our own experience what an imperative necessity it is for love to pour itself out in blessing on the ones it loves and can we not understand that god who is love who is if i may say so made out of love simply cannot help blessing us we do not need to beg him to bless us he simply cannot help it 
Therefore God is enough. God is enough for time. God is enough for eternity. God is enough. Only to sit and think of God, oh what a joy it is, to think the thought, to breathe the name, earth has no higher bliss. End of chapter 17 And the end of The God of All Comfort by Hannah Whittle Smith